So it's winter and you're cranking at the miles on your trainer, getting your cardio, you feel good. But lately you wonder if that's enough, if you're really checking all the boxes. And so you go looking for answers. And you're gonna find answers. But this is not one of those videos. Cause you know what? Those videos are not for us. Once you hit middle age, it's time to change your search terms. Once we hit middle age, whether the pros strength train or not, really doesn't matter. They're playing a different game. And if you're thinking, I've been doing this for a while, I'm good. Hold up, this impacts you too. Things change after 50. On the one hand, if we wanna be on cycling trips in our 80s, we have to be strong now. It's as simple as that. We have to be okay carving out time from cycling for strength. That's non-negotiable at our age. We have to lift heavy weights. But on the other hand, trying to do the right thing with the wrong form could sideline you in ways that actually shorten your life. Well, if that sounds a bit dramatic. Well, stick around. The stakes are high. I've got some bad news. And I've got some good news, but most importantly, as I approach my own one year strength training anniversary, well, far from an expert, with all the research I've done since, I realized that I managed to totally force gump my way into a really, really good, safe, efficacious approach. An approach that combines strength and stability and balance. Okay, should we get the bad news out of the way? We're losing muscle mass. We lose anywhere from three to 8% of our muscle mass each decade. Let's read this from Outlive. An 80 year old man will have about 40% less muscle tissue in his quad than he did at 25. But if you think loss of muscle mass is bad, hang on to your hat. Here's Dr. Andy Galpin, professor of kinesiology at Cal State and pretty much the go-to on strength and performance these days. So people will tend to hear numbers like you lose about 1% of muscle size per year after age about 40. And that's true. However, what they don't realize is you lose about 2 to 4% of your strength per year. So the loss of strength is almost double that the loss of muscle mass with aging. Muscle power is more like 8 to 10% per year. And so we can very clearly see the problem you're going to have with aging is not going to be preservation of muscle although that is incredibly important. It's going to be very specifically preservation of muscle power and strength. And to drive this home, here's Dr. Peter Atia. How much of a hazard ratio do these bring to you in terms of all-cause mortality? They're, they're quite big, you know, it, it, hypertension is about a 20%, uh, type two diabetes is about a 30% increase in mortality. Smoking is 50% uh, increase. Being weak, relative to being strong is about 250%. Here's what my 56 year old self would tell my 25 year old self if she could. Get in the gym and build some damn muscle. Oh, and uh, buy Apple stock. Because another bad thing is happening in parallel to muscle loss. Your bones are getting weaker for women and men, but particularly for women post-menopause. Our bone density or bone strength peaks in our 20s, which is a bummer to learn when you're in your 50s or 60s. But you can retain and even build bone later in life. Here's how that happens. The key is how much can you slow the rate of decline? And nothing is more important for that than load-bearing activity. And in fact, it needs to be you know heavy load-bearing activity. Walking does not count as load-bearing activity. Uh, running, certainly better than swimming or cycling where you're not bearing load, but none of those compare to strength training. Did you catch that? As cyclists, we're not bearing load. Our bikes are bearing the load. And it's not just muscle and bone loss we're fighting. Our brain-body connection starts to decay. And the term for this is proprioception. So here's how I think of it. Imagine you're a jet cruising at 30,000 feet. The cockpit is like your brain with all its screens and buttons controlling the autopilot, receiving feedback from sensors on the wing and the tail, the fuel. All these inputs help it keep its 
altitude and attitude and keep it from suddenly nosediving and hurtling towards the ground. But if for some reason that were to happen, the inputs would alert you to pull up, pull up. Keep your eyes on the fire. And regain control. Well, our body, our joints, skin, muscles, tendon, etc., are all sending signals to our brain. But as we age, that connection decays and we start to fall more. And as cyclists, we're so fit, we might think, well, this isn't gonna happen to me. In our new email, The Signal this week, I'm sharing a personal story on this. Building muscle mass after 50 is hard. And that kind of sucks for those of us just getting the message now. But build muscle and strength we must, because here's what happens after 50. But when you think about the physical decline a person experiences from 20 to 30, and then 30 to 40, and then 40 to 50, most people are like, yeah, I kind of got a handle on that. And what they don't realize is that the rate of decline so much is going much, oh, yeah, it's just, yeah. it's, it's accelerating so dramatically. Mm -hmm. And what you do from 50 to 60 to 70 is amazing. Now, again, people who have you know, been able to watch their parents age or have spent enough time around people who are elderly will realize that if you don't put an astronomical amount of work into it, right. the decline that occurs between 60 and 70 and 80 is from another world. Oh, I'm building a case here. Is it working? Let me know in the comments. I've been at this twice a week for about a year. And according to my Garmin skill, my muscle mass is now down 0.6 pounds. And by the way, we're gonna put that metric to a real deal test in an upcoming video. So stay tuned on that one. So is it all for nothing? Well, hell no, but we'll get to that. What took me so long? Well, you might relate to this. As a mountain biker, I'd convinced myself that it was cardio and strength. I mean, have you seen my trails? <laughs> but of course it's not. I just didn't want to go down to the gym. The gym that's in my building. Head coach Chris Carmichael at CTS calls it the cyclist paradox. Cyclists have extremely well-developed aerobic engines yet very underdeveloped musculoskeletal systems for any sport other than cycling. Oof. As time-crunched athletes, we choose the bike, but as he says, lifelong cyclists end up with severely underdeveloped upper body strength. Cyclists are incredible athletes as far as endurance goes, but a great deal of them fight like little bitches. Look, it might serve Jonas Vingegaard to have arms like this, but down the road, it becomes a legit hazard. We need strength and mobility from our neck to our toes. I know lifelong cyclists that still believe that we shouldn't put any muscle mass on up here, but we're on the ultimate century ride now. We need all the strength and muscle that we could get. Okay, so we're about to summit the cold of bad news. Injuries become catastrophic. So we're losing muscle mass and bone strength along with it. Oh, and don't forget, your brain isn't quite as on it as it used to be, so we tend to fall more. And when we do, it's worse than just being sidelined and having to look at all the great pics of the cafe stop your friends just posted on Strava. Being sidelined is a big deal. The data really sucks on this. Here's Dr. Galpin again. So in order to pick up your grandkids, you need to not be in the hospital. Right? You need to be not living in an assisted living home. You know what puts people in an assisted living home? Falling and breaking the hip. The connection between morbidity, mortality, with a hip break is extraordinary after the age of 60. It's not even 90, it is 60-ish. Um, reason, large reason people fall is they actually don't have foot speed. What do you mean? If you catch yourself your toe on the corner or you slip, you have to have the foot speed be able to put your other foot or that foot back out in front of you in the proper position. Then you have to have the eccentric strength to stop that fall. And so I need foot speed to get there and I need eccentric strength to brace the fall so you don't land and break your hip. That's what's gonna keep you playing with your kids when you're 60. 60. A study of people 
with an average age of 67 found that after just 10 days of bed rest, which is about what a person would experience from a major illness or orthopedic injury, study participants lost an average of 3.3 pounds of lean mass or, or muscle. That's substantial and it shows just how dangerous inactivity can be, especially when you remember that putting muscle on after 50 is hard. Think of it like a cascade. It takes so little time to lose muscle strength when you're sidelined. And then maybe the injury haunts you and affects your movement and maybe even your confidence and either you can't get out on your bike or you don't want to. You start losing your aerobic fitness and your VO2 max starts declining. We talked about that all important metric in our last video. And then you stop seeing your friends at the group ride and your life gets a bit smaller. It seems ridiculous, but that one thing can send you on a life limiting trajectory. Well, this is a bit depressing. You wanna hit the gym with me? Or are you ready for the good news? Because there's just so much good news if we make time for strength. Ah, time, I get it. There's only so many hours in the week for training and riding outside. So maybe instead of more time, you trade an hour or two of cardio for strength. And you may be okay with that once you realize it will make you a better cyclist. I noticed after just a few months that I had a new gear on my technical mountain bike climbs. Here's certified personal trainer, Derek Teal with Trainer Road. In a nutshell, it makes your muscles stronger. It helps you produce more force. Now it also makes you more efficient with your power transfer. So the force that you can produce is actually usable if you are training total body and training your core. Using equipment to just hammer your legs like a leg press over and over and over again is great for force production. But if you have an unstable body that can't translate it to the bike, then you're like a cannon on a canoe. I mean, we all know your quads are the dominant uh, driving force of knee extension, pedal, pedal stroke itself, but they could be working harder than they need to be if your hamstrings are dormant. So you want to make sure that your hamstrings are strong, that they're activated and able to keep up with what your quads are doing so that you can use all of the available muscle that you have. This is really muscle efficiency. For a lot of people with overused quads, it could come in the form of patella tendonitis. If you have a low back that's trying to do the work that your abs should be doing, then it could result in low back pain. Those are the things that come through when you don't have a well-rounded training program. And there's just so many of those things that you can't do on the bike. As much as I wish that you could, you just, you cannot do it because of the position that you're in. Strength training makes you less prone to overuse injuries. It also makes you less prone to acute injuries. And when you train in different planes of motion, let's just say laterally, for example, you are more durable to withstand an impact that you don't expect. Let's just say you're cornering and you hit a pothole and it's very jarring. These are things that tweak people on the bike all the time. <laughs> when you have a well-rounded program and a healthy body, these things happen less often. So more power, more efficiency. But as Derek mentioned, when we strength train, we're less likely to develop repetitive use injuries. According to this meta-analysis, strength training reduced sports injuries to less than one third and overuse injuries could be almost halved. Think about that. You are two thirds less likely to get injured and about half as likely to get an overuse injury. That reminds me of a comment on a GCN video I read a while back and it really stuck with me. He said, I'm 64 now and thinking my days on the bike may be over. I don't wanna fall and injure myself. But I think stopping is the greater threat. VO2 max and strength. According to Dr. Atia, nothing correlates with health span more than those two things. And here's the great news on falling, that brain-body connection. When you strength train, those signals to your brain can be repaired and strengthened. You can get it back, yay! So not only are you less likely to fall, if you do trip, your strength and improved stability will likely save you and if not, you're gonna have what Peter Atia calls a suit of armor, stronger bones and musculature that will protect you. And on the topic of our brains, strength training is associated with a 70% less chance of Alzheimer's disease. 
Here's Dr. Atia. When we see that the top 10% of people with grip strength compared to the bottom 10% of people with grip strength have a 70% less chance of getting Alzheimer's disease and a 70% chance of dying from Alzheimer's disease, it's not because grip strength by itself protects your brain. Right. It's because those people by definition are doing so much more physically and it's the doing part that is protecting their brain. Hmm. And this study by Yale Nets in Frontiers in Medicine found that while both cardio and strength improve neuroplasticity or how our brains rewire new pathways, it's the intensity and complexity of strength and stability training that provides specific advantages. But that's not all. <laughs> I mentioned it's hard but not impossible to grow more muscle mass after 50. But when we strength train, not only can we hang on to the muscle mass we still have, we will get so much stronger. I may have a complete lack of muscle mass gain after a year, but I'm definitely stronger. You've got to check this out. This is the Lift More study from Australia. These women are working out to beat brittle bones. Chin over the bar. Good, now come down. It's a new way to prevent crippling osteoporosis, high intensity weight training instead of low impacts. When you are older and you have osteoporosis, those kinds of exercises were always thought to be dangerous. But the eight month study by Griffith University has found the opposite. Since this, I, I don't fall. These women, all over 60, have built up bone mass and recorded less falls. I had no strength whatsoever. Now Robin Anderson is deadlifting. Between 50 and 55. Almost her body weight. Sue Salter's personal best is 72 kilos. Six. <laughs> We've had amazing results compared to the results that you typically see in the literature. A dramatic difference in bone density, a dramatic difference in strength, less falls, all in just eight months. And as we get older, all this strength training will help us to look younger. Because as my own trainer, Roshan, taught me, we live life forward. We're hunched at our desks, looking at screens, on our bikes. In the gym, we balance it out by working our back muscles, pulling our scaps back into place, making sure our shoulders are strong and stable. And the outcome of all this? We look younger. We can't do much about this. Well, technically we can, but I swear I'm not doing it. I'm not doing that. <laughs> but when we're not pitched forward like this, common for men, or this, common for women, we just look good. And on top of that, I feel like a well-oiled machine these days. All those ass to the grass squats, reaching, extending while pulling, and stability exercises are making me feel fluid. I really notice it on our sunrise walks. I can sprint to make a light and it just feels great. It's the other part of the one-two exercise punch required to age well, to claim what I like to call the bonus years. Here's Peter Atia and Dr. Lane Norton. And when you show somebody this graph, because it's so pronounced, I've never seen a person who doesn't just stop in their tracks because they cannot believe how much morbidity and mortality results from falling and frailty once you reach about the age of 70, 75. I mean, the data is there to back it up. They've done these meta-analyses of mortality mm -hmm. showing that your lean body mass is inversely proportional to your risk of mortality. So the hazard ratio for being strong to not strong is about 3.2 for all cause mortality. Think about that. Which is a big hazard ratio. It's a freaking staggering hazard ratio. Just the amount of benefit you will get from three times a week, 30 to 40 minutes of resistance training will be unbelievable in terms of your level of fitness and your ability to live a long, healthy life. I love that. But before you drop down and give me 20, One, sir. Two, sir. even if you've been lifting for years, I want you to ask yourself this. Why does Peter Atia have a trainer? He's been lifting since he was like 14. Why are his new patients asked to stop strength training? Well, 
Peter Atia doesn't just have a personal trainer. He has a movement and strength coach. Because before we can build strength, we need to move well. We need stability in our joints. We need to work on balance. And guess what? Balance can be trained. When Peter met his coach, Beth Lewis, she asked him to show her a squat. And to his shock, she gave him a failing grade. He was listening to one side, kicking off a six month hiatus from lifting any weight while they rebuilt his form. He had to go backwards to go forwards. I was lucky enough to have a friend first chide me into strength training at all. And then he recommended a firm that he used after he hurt himself in the gym. In retrospect, I totally lucked out. I didn't know what I didn't know. My coach Roshan is also a movement and strength trainer. They're out there. He has us doing what Beth has Peter doing. Uh, okay, that sounds spendy. Yeah, I get it. I was determined not to spend any money on this. But you know what costs more? Physio. Even worse, and this is playing out in my own family. Down the road, things like stair lifts, home care, assisted living. Trust me, this pales in comparison. We need to think of it as an investment in ourselves. One with like enormous payback. But you want to kick this off the right way. So I mentioned that I managed to totally force gump my way into a really good, safe, but effective situation. Here's what I think you want to look for as you shop for both a movement and strength specialist. First of all, they should have a really robust intake form. They want to know all about you, how you live, your goals, your fitness, injuries, diet, etc., etc. And your job is to think hard about your goals. Yeah, on the bike, but also what you're training for later in life, in your 80s and 90s. What do you want your life to look like specifically? Next, they should require a movement assessment with you that they film and photograph so that they can study where you're strong, where you're weak, where you may be compensating. This is why Atiyah's patients are asked to stop strength training. They want to assess their movement patterns first. If you've been strength training for years, it may be time to get a pro to take you through this to see where you stand or maybe how you stand. This is how they'll formulate a strength and stability prescription based on your movement assessment. We all have different starting lines. Yes, we must lift heavy weights in time. Take Glenn and me. I fully expected him to be stronger than me, but what I did not expect is I wouldn't even pick up a weight for a couple of months. I had valgus knee. When I did my squats, my knees caved in. My legs were not as strong as I thought they'd be. So my squats started out with a band. As I've mentioned before, I've had a high hamstring injury for years. Before I could get near a deadlift, Roshan helped me to work on range of motion or I'd be off the bike for sure. And by the way, just learning proper deadlift technique is so important. It's super complex. And the last thing you want is to hear a pop in your back. It's all about control. And just like Beth, my coach had us focus on slowing the eccentric part of the movement, the control part. So concentric is the power part of the move that. Eccentric is like the setting down under control. Concentric, eccentric. Faster, slower. Listen to Beth and Peter talk about eccentric strength. It's kind of equated to like a sports car with no brakes. It goes super fast, but that's not great if you can't stop yourself. So like I'll see it a lot with like big strong dudes. They'll do a, a body weight split squat and just crash to the ground because they have no eccentric control. And that's a body control thing too. Just being able to control that descent. Next, a good coach will know when it's time to progress, to wait, 
to more weight, to new exercises, more reps. It's so helpful early on. And a good coach will also have you work on stability. There's lots of strength trainers out there, but we're looking for someone who integrates stability. It's just so key as we get older, keeping our feet and toes moving properly, our connection with the ground, making sure our spines function fully so that movement happens where it should, keeping joints strong and moving well. A good coach will introduce you to all kinds of stability and balance exercises. And here's a pro tip. If your strength and stability coach isn't taking notes, isn't taking pictures, consider finding one that does. Think about it. They're working with so many clients every day. And in the course of a week, how on earth are they going to remember how you made out with your deadlift last week? Mine did. Beth does. But I see trainers in my own gym who are just yelling, give me one more. <laughs> Here's a great tip from an old guy. The co-author of this book noted that once you're in the second half, your coach will probably be a lot younger than you. So only you know how things feel. So you're ultimately in charge of you. And here's a tip from me. Digging into this stuff continually blows my mind. <laughs> and we're sharing the best bite size did not know that research in our new email, The Signal. It's also blowing my mind how many of you have already joined us. So happy to have you guys on this ride with us. Okay, that's it. See you next time.